Good evening, everybody. Good evening and welcome to the Victoria and Albert Museum. My name is Jo Bannum. I'm Head of Adult Learning here, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you this evening. This is the second, I think, in our regular series of talks about fashion and fiction. It's a series that's been put together by the broadcaster and journalist Rosie Goldsmiths, and she invites different authors to come and talk about their work, but also particularly about their interest in dress and fashion. We're very pleased that tonight she's invited one of our best-known contemporary authors. Linda Grant is a writer who's produced many, many novels and books. She's been nominated for the Man Booker Prize, uh, the Orange Prize for Fiction, um, for several of her books, and many, again, relate to her interest in clothes. Um, and finally, just to ask you to very warmly welcome Rosie Goldsmith and Linda Grant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe, and as always, a pleasure to be here. So welcome to all of you, and thank you for coming. Um, tonight, I'm delighted once again to bring together several of my great passions under one glorious roof, fashion, fiction, uh, the Victoria and Albert Museum, which provides the roof, and the novels and person of Linda Grant. Now, this, as Joe says, is a new series of illustrated interviews with great writers from around the world who also believe, as I do, in the creative crossover of fashion and fiction. Now, clothing and costume, as you know, have been integral to plot and character across cultures and across the centuries. If you just think of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, Scott Fitzgerald's Great Gatsby, Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall, Maupassant's Emma Bovary, and Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale. And we had Margaret Atwood as our first fashion and fiction and fashionista, I think we can call them. Um, I'm delighted to continue this series with Linda Grant, who is a fearless fashionista and, of course, um, a prize-winning novelist. Now, all her superb novels, and I say because I've actually read them, um, from the cast iron shore to the clothes on their backs and the latest upstairs at the party stand out because they make clothes key to understanding character, identity, society, and history. Now, in addition to novels and essays, she's also been a fashion journalist or a journalist who writes on fashion for Vogue, The Guardian, and Harper's and others. And she herself, I think, is a supremely thoughtful dresser, and that's also the title of her book of essays about her own relationship with clothes, um, which she'll be talking about. Now, when I re read the final chapter in that book, The Red Shoe, I was moved to tears, not only because um, this is probably my favorite personal item of clothing, but because of the very eloquent, intelligent, and heartfelt description of a red shoe she'd seen at, um, on a visit to Auschwitz, which had belonged to a Holocaust survivor. A Holocaust victim. Um, Linda writes with honesty, always, about the pain and pleasure of clothes in our lives. Now, she writes about the complete person, as few writers do, except perhaps in the great European, 19th century European novels. And her characters, I think, are even more memorable in the events as well, more sharply defined, because of those red shoes or the, the blue jacket. Now, after reading Linda Grant's 2008 novel, The Clothes on Their Backs, which is one of my favorite novels of all time, and shortlisted, as Joe said, for the Man Booker Prize, I was hooked on her writing and wondered why all novelists don't write about clothes. And why do some writers think that fashion and dress are superfluous and trivial? As you'll hear in her lecture, Linda's convinced us, like few other writers today, that clothes really do matter in fiction. And she argues the case for fashion in fiction by discussing her own novels and some great fashion and fiction writers, such as Marcel Proust and Virginia Woolf. So enjoy Linda Grant's lecture. Thank you very much. Linda Grant. I'm going to start off by describing a few items of clothing from literature, and you can guess where they come from. An inordinate number of gowns in different fabrics, silk, crepe de chine, chiffon, and colours range varying from old rose and mauve to tiepolo pink and gold. Collars of blouses like Gothic carvings. 
An appearance at the opera with a single egrette feather in the hair and a white spangled dress deliberately designed to make everyone else feel overdressed. Worn in the hair, tiny coral balls frosted with diamonds and likened to rose hips dusted with ice. A pleated fortuny gown. But does everyone know by now which French novelist was obsessed with fashion, who documented the style of the haute monde, demi monde, and bourgeoisie, for whom the work of the craftswoman in the atelier was as important to describe as a Renaissance painting, the porch of a country church, the white flowers of a hawthorn bush, or the nightmarish scene inside a brothel? When people who have never read Proust complain that he is difficult, I say, what do you think he writes about? Time, they reply vaguely. It's true that the sentences may go on for a page and a half and there's no perfect translation that loses the florid style, but the subject matter is sex and frocks and parties. No one has written about clothes as well as Proust while simultaneously being considered the most literary of writers. The 19th century novel is fascinated by clothes and why wouldn't it be? In an era when fashion was ornate, and the female body hidden between, beneath hoops, bustles, long hems, and multiple types of fabric on the same garment. To add to the fear amongst many readers of difficulty in literature, we can add the fear of fashion in fiction, which has developed over the past two decades or so, a fear which besets both writers, who are anxious that their work should not be considered frivolous and down market, and critics who worry that any reference to what the characters are wearing detracts from the inner consciousness, the life of the mind, ideas. We are all dressed. Everyone in this room is wearing clothes. Everyone outside this room is wearing clothes. For many of us, the only time we are naked is in the bathroom or while having sex. Clothes are unavoidable. You will be allowed to starve to death begging outside South Kensington tube station, but if you are for a moment left without even the clothes on your back, you will either be quickly given some or taken to a police station, and that, of course, is the naked rambler who has been arrested many, many times, handed a blanket, food, and roof over your head. So clothes are everything. We all have to wear something, and what we wear is influenced, of course, by fashion, or you would be sitting in front of me in ruffs, ruffs bustles, and doublets. Those who are not interested in fashion will tell you, of course, that they don't care what they wear and what they buy is simply what's available in the shops. So fashion has influenced them despite their studied indifference to it. The idea that clothes are just something you put on to protect you from temperature, other surfaces, and unwanted sexual attention is risible. But many people go on pretending that what they wear has no significance and that no one is looking at you. Of course you are being looked at. When I'm on the tube and see someone looking wonderful, and I emphatically don't mean a size zero 20-year-old 20, 20 wearing this season, but a grandmother who has tied a scarf round her neck in an interesting way, that is a small pleasure for the day. In the textile galleries of this museum, which I visit regularly, we can view fashion in various ways, as social history, as craft, as fabric, as ideas. One of the most pleasurable shows I've seen here a decade ago, The Golden Age of Couture, exhibited clothes sumptuous, extravagant, requiring the highest level of technique and expense, and requiring corseting so no one really wears them anymore. I remember visiting the show with a friend and her young daughter, who looking at one of the most ornate dresses I've ever seen, said, but who would wear a dress like that? I looked at the card next to it and told her, the Queen. If you go to Fashion Week or see the collections on a YouTube video, you don't see the models, you see the clothes. The models are, I'm afraid, coat hangers for the frocks. They are, as I'm sure you all know, selected for specific proportions and a uniform look. When I covered London Fashion Week, I had to get over an innate impulse to look at a dress and think, how would that look on me? Which is how most women walking into a shop see its contents. Though it's, of course, true that we can just look at clothes in sheer admiration. We might have at home in our wardrobes decades old things that we keep simply because they're beautiful, even though we may never wear them again. 
But to me, as a writer, clothes are a telling psychological insight into character. Here is the very first sentence of Middlemarch. Miss Brooke had the kind of beauty which seems to be thrown into relief by poor dress. George Eliot goes on to compare Dorothea's style to that of her sister Celia, explaining that both of them dress plainly because they regarded, quote, frippery as the ambition of the huckster's daughter and indulged in well-bred economy, which in those days made show in dress as the first item to be deducted from when any margin was required for expenses more distinctive of rank. But Dorothea suppresses finery because of her deep-seated religious feeling, while Celia, quote, mildly acquiesced in all her sister's sentiments, only infusing them with that common sense which is able to accept momentous doctrines without any eccentric agitation. So George Eliot lays out the fundamental characteristics of both of the sisters and their socioeconomic class, rather in the manner of the sketch showing three men of descending sizes and classes looking down on or up to each other. George Eliot was not afraid of clothes. Virginia Woolf was afraid of clothes, but only because she considered them so important that she was perpetually anxious that she didn't understand them. She was afraid of buying a dress or going to the dressmaker to have one made, not because she didn't think that either of these activities were important, but rather she needed to feel that whatever she wore was truly expressive of herself, and the complicated semiotics of fashion made that difficult to accomplish. Her diaries are full of anguished complaints about her conceptual problems with dress. In May 1926, she wrote in her diary, but I must remember to write about my clothes next time I have an impulse to write. My love of clothes interests me profoundly, only it is not love, and what it is, I must discover. The previous month, she wrote, but my present reflection is that people have any numbers of states of consciousness and I should like to investigate the party consciousness, the frock consciousness, etc. The fashion world is certainly one where people secrete an envelope which connects them and protects them from others like myself, who am outside the envelope, foreign bodies. These states are very difficult. Obviously, I grope for words, but I'm always coming back to it. Still, I cannot get at what I mean. I have great sympathy with Wolfe's dilemma, but rereading Mrs. Dalloway a few months ago, I was struck by her descriptions of Mrs. Dalloway walking with joy down Bond Street early in the morning while the shops are still only starting to open. And it's a very different Bond Street to today with a florist and a fishmonger's and a shop that just sells gloves. Because when she doesn't try to think about walking down the street and looking in the windows of the just waking shops, she feels herself connected with all of London and with that day and with that moment. And I have felt exactly the same thing. I love being amongst the shops. They cheer me up. I was brought up by parents who cared a great deal about what they wore. My immigrant grandfather's motto was, the only thing worse than being skint is looking as though you're skint. Arriving in England at the turn of the last century, he quickly observed that clothes were a class signifier and that if you wanted to advance in life, as immigrants tend to do, partly because they haven't been formed by the internalised restrictions of the class system, you wore clothes that signified the class you wanted to be. So you saved up to buy a Homburg hat instead of a cap. My father made a living from manufacturing a form of perm lotion called Cold Wave and sold setting lotion, shampoo, conditioner, clips and hair nets to hairdressers. And my private education, which sent me in the direction of Virginia Woolf from an early age, was funded by women's so-called vanity. In the last few years of her life, my mother, suffering from vascular dementia, unable to say with any clarity how exactly she was related to me, could nonetheless enter John Lewis, choose a jacket for herself, and then determinedly walk the floor until she found a skirt that exactly matched the navy, which happened to be Ralph Lauren. I was a teenager at a period when dress radically altered, one of those seismic moments when the young and old find themselves on opposite sides of a dividing line, a bit like the midriff exposing tops of a few years ago and skinny jeans. In this case, it was waistless, sleeveless mini dresses, 
and a bare face in which the eyes but not the mouth were made prominent look but don't speak. Clothes were the signifier of rebellion, of cool, of modernity. At school, we were burdened by sumptuary rules about the length of our box pleat navy skirts. We were made to kneel down to check whether the hem met the floor. When, after the release of the film Bonnie and Clyde, maxi skirts arrived, we pulled down the zip so the skirt reached mid-calf. There was an ongoing struggle between my mother and I about how to dress. She wanted me to wear young Jaeger. I wanted to wear Chelsea Girl. And all this time, while I was using style to rebel, I was also reading. Now, when I read literature, particularly children's books, I don't think any of it represented any family remotely like mine. There has lately come a demand from readers in book groups for, quote, novels that are relevant to my personal experience. Well, nobody I knew rowed boats across lakes or went crabbing in rock pools. They went to the hairdressers and they went shopping or they went out to work in businesses. And when I read in a novel, she came towards me in a dress the color of the underside of a heron's wing. I couldn't have told you what a heron looked like, never mind getting close enough to one to pick its wing up. What my mother would have asked, what I would have asked was, Nicole Fari, Margaret Howell, ghost? But these are questions that apparently can't be addressed in literature. You can describe landscape, you can know the vocabulary that distinguishes between a rill and a brook, and know the names of trees. But mentioning, say, Versace is a ticket to the waste bin of literary seriousness, chiclet. It's difficult to remember that there was a time before this genre. There were several categories of commercial fiction, fiction aimed at women the Mills and Boone romance, the 80s bonk buster, feminist crime, which was a thing in the 80s and 90s, and the bodice ripper. But the publication of Bridget Jones' diary, which had started out as a weekly column in The Independent, was a new way of writing about contemporary young women, their diets, their fixation with men, their biological clocks, and shopping. It's all because it was, in its way, perfectly realistic about young women's insecurities. It overlapped with the TV series Sex in the City, which unlike anything that went before was a showcase for fashion. That was one of the reasons to watch it, to see what Carrie Bradshaw would be wearing next. I remember being at the cinema for the film version and the audience erupting in shrieks and gasps when they saw the walk-in closet in the apartment Big was proposing to buy. These were all, at least at first, single women they had control over their own finances and they could spend as much as they liked on clothes. Costumed by Patricia Field, the series became as much about clothes as it was about sex. It introduced its audience to red-soled Louboutin shoes and the idea that shoes were objects of desire, collectibles. There, were about, there was an item about buying fake baguette handbags from the trunk of a car in LA or being mugged for your Louboutins. It was an era just before the credit crunch of conspicuous consumption, when 20-year-olds were going into credit card debt to buy 1,000-pound Marc Jacobs stand bags because celebs were carrying them. The problem that Chicklet raised was that it became a category which, being known for writing about clothes and fashion, became the means by which you could fence off fashion as a subject that didn't belong in literature. There was deemed to be a kind of seepage in which an interest in clothes in one genre contaminated another, so that writing about clothes became the signifier of a lack of literary seriousness. To write about a hillside is art, to write about a jacket is commerce. What was also happening in fashion was both the rise of the brand and brand culture, a subject too complex for me to address here, plus a moral indignation about the ethics of the whole fashion industry, the unhealthy insistence on thinness leading to eating disorders, the environmental impact of fast fashion, and the exploitation of sweatshop labor. With this distaste and disgust, for many thoughtful people, the whole world of fashion became a zone of moral outrage. It has always been the case that women, and indeed men, who cared about what they wore, were written off as empty-headed, shallow bird brains, fops and dandies. You could not be clever if you were interested in what you wore. 
Mrs. Dalloway disapproves of Miss Kilman, who year in, year out, wears the same green Macintosh and, quote, would do anything for the Russians, starved herself for the, for the Austrians, but she was never in the room five minutes without making you feel her superiority. So apparently you cannot be well-dressed if you had your, have your head in a book or be a character in a book. For you're not supposed to know what fictional people are wearing in the same way that no one in literature, apart from Leopold Bloom and Ulysses, ever goes to the bathroom. A literary critic said he wasn't looking forward to reviewing my novel, The Clothes on his, Their Backs, not his kind of thing. I pointed out that in his byline photo, not only was he wearing clothes himself, but also a necklace, which he sheepishly conceded was from a beach bum period in his life. We have been sending warm clothes to the refugees in the camps in Calais. Refugees and survivors of disasters, earthquakes, tsunamis, will often tell you that they were left with nothing but the clothes on my back. For if you have almost nothing, the last nothing you will have are your clothes. You'll starve before you're naked. So to be left with just your clothes, no possessions, is to say that you only possess the last remnant of what it is to be human. In that novel, I considered the experience of the post-war survivor of a group of Hungarian slave laborers who had marched off to war in a suit and tie and was left in lice-ridden rags at the end. Unsurprisingly, he lacks the innate puritanism of some aspects of English life and loves expensive suits, jewelry, perfumed women. His girlfriend is the manageress of an expensive dress shop and will sell the recently widowed narrator Diane von Furstenberg wrap dress in silk jersey. Clothes are essential to this novel. The Holocaust survivor Shandor uses them as a means of separating himself from the depravity of his victimhood. For his black girlfriend, the shop manageress, clothes are the way you give yourself dignity and armor to stand up to racism. For the punk tube train driver, his leather jacket is the antidote to his London transport uniform. For Vivian, being dressed by other people, changing her style according to the transformations in herself, or a means of separating herself from the depressing timidity of her parents and acquiring an adult identity. I sometimes think that the novel would have been taken more seriously in some quarters have I called it something different. I've seen reviews on Amazon and Goodreads from people who have said, I thought this was going to be a lovely light read, or I was put off by the title because I thought it was going to be some silly chick lit book. So I want to conclude by saying that clothes and sometimes fashion, because the two are quite hard to separate, are intrinsic to my work and always have been. Because I think that clothes and fashion are interesting and there is not enough in fashion writing which tells you about the intimate relationship between ourselves and what we wear. Um, an area of attention most fashion people tend to ignore, I'm afraid. Clothes are bound up with our personal histories. They are with us every day. They are friends and enemies. They cause us to be judged every time we leave the house, whether are, we are conscious of this or not. Proust's subject was time, as in a different way was Virginia Woolf's, and time is the essence of fashion. Our clothes aren't just what we wear, but the story of our lives. And if that's not the subject of the novel, I don't know what is. Thank you. Anyway, thank you very, very much, Linda, for that. Um, lots of uh, thought-provoking ideas. And um, we will have questions from you, I hope, um, after we've had a, a bit of a chat as well. Um, I suppose I want to ask you, when your interest in clothes, your own family interest and um, your mother's interest, in clothes, when did your interest in clothes actually... Um, become an interest in writing about clothes? Um, when, um, when I started to write, I, 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 I wrote my first novel quite late. I was in my early 40s. And I think that one of the things which had sort of delayed me in a way was that so much in the, in the English novel describes landscape. And I don't even have the vocabulary to describe landscape, and I'm not terribly interested in it. I don't mind reading about it, but I'm not really interested in being in it. Um, <laughs> and I had read a, a really quite remarkable account of a woman who uh, joined the American Communist Party in the 1930s, and she described herself as being vain and shallow, 
um, and interested in clothes, but said, but being a communist made me better than I was. It could all have been so much worse. And I was really kind of quite fascinated about this dichotomy. And quite a lot of women who were members of the Communist Party were actually extremely well-dressed and took great account of fashion. And this seemed to me to be a contradiction which really, really deserved um, some exploration. And what happened was when I, I, I wrote a, an opening section and I sent it to my agent who asked me to write some more, and then there was a very funny phone call when he rang me and he said, no, I'm really happy with what you've written, but your research is showing. And I said, what, what do you mean? And he said, well, well, when you describe the clothes, you talk about the designer who made them. And there was a sort of pause, and he said, am I saying that because I'm a man? And I said, well, would you think my research was showing if I said that the car was a Rolls Royce or a Note Rover? Oh, no, he said. So then I sort of realized that, you know, clothes were something that I was interested in, in writing about and wanted to write about. And I wanted to write about somebody who who really begins as a clothes horse and finds an identity but does not throw off that, you know, that sense of being interested in, in clothes and fashion. I mean, and that, I mean, you have found um, a unique voice, and I know that word unique is overused, but there is no other writer like you writing so much about clothes and the meaning of clothes, and it goes back to what you were telling us about your own family and yeah. your you know, parents coming over and refugees yeah. and so on yeah. too. And I think, and I'm very glad you made the reference to today as well because mm. we hear so much about clothes and refugees mm. and it is all they have and the bundles on their backs, all they have. And um, you know, the fact that clothes are more than frivolous um, women's um, chicklitization of fashion and so on, all those words you've been using, um, if it's such a big struggle, and there are so few people writing about the centrality of fashion, how are we going to change the situation? Well, I mean, the thing is, I don't think it's always been the case that women haven't written about, or that writers have not written about. I think there's actually, if, if you go back, there's an enormous amount. Uh, Jean Rhys was, you know, tremendously interested in clothes. I think it is possibly the puritanism of literary criticism or of the review pages. That, um, that have such trouble with it, you know, that, that you know, have this idea of, of shallowness. But also, I think that chick lit really did compound that problem because really from the sort of, you know, people like Judith Krantz in the 80s, who was very, very good at talking about labels, you know, there's a lot in her books about designer labels. You knew what people were wearing. And I, I love Judith Krantz's books. Um, I think she's a really quite underrated writer, but she, you know, I learned the names of American fashion designers from her. And so, because this is, this is you know, this is part of what, what, what's regarded as women's commercial fiction, it's very difficult for reviewers to accept that as a valid way of looking at the world. Although men are as interested in fashion these days as much more than before. Well, I, I think that um, something which has happened relatively recently is that the generation of six-year-olds who had a tantrum if they didn't have the right trainers um, are now spending their um, disposable income on designer labels. Uh, I think that has changed utterly, and I suspect that even you know non-fashion non journalism hasn't really caught up with that. I mean, it's a very different phenomenon. It's, it's much more label and brand than does my bum look big in this. It's a very, very interesting subject. We've moved on. <laughs> um, the, you spoke about the language um, of fashion in a way. You were talking about the language of nature and so on. Is there a different kind of language you have to use? I mean, you have to be able to describe textures and colors and so on, which you do absolutely wonderfully. I mean, the images I have from your books, and they are very often images, are because you have described, described um, clothes or accessories or the emotion somebody feels after buying a dress um, or particular shoes in difficult situations um, because you've described them so beautifully. Well, it's good of you to say because I always feel that I kind of completely struggle with that aspect of it, um, describing what, you know, what something looks like. And I remember the first time I ever went to a fashion 
uh, fashion show, it was, uh, Paris Fashion Week um, in 2003. I was at the Dior show and I remember the clothes, and I was going, I, what, what? I understand anything I've seen. And having to read the, Susie Menkes the next day so she could explain it to me. Um, so fashion is, you know, proper fashion is really quite difficult for most people to understand and I have a great deal of respect for it. But what I'm interested in is the relationship between ourselves and what we wear. I'm interested in the human dimension of it and how we feel like, you know, why is it, you know, there's a wonderful quote from Noel Stretfield, which is, a new dress is a great help in almost all circumstances. And, you know, we all know the truth of that, don't we? So I'm much more interested in the psychological mechanism that, you know, of, of trying to contemplate why that is the case. And that's that Virginia Woolf quote is so amazing because she talks about, you know, that, that party situation, the frock situation, and her attempts to understand it. And the fear. I mean, I think that's very interesting as well. To, I mean, if we, we stick to the psychology of um, writing about clothes, um, if you like, but the, the, you spoke about her fear of clothes yeah. because they, they were so important. But there's also, psychologically, there's also... Um, I don't know whether you feel this, I think you do, from the thoughtful dresser, is that the, the, the sheer beauty of the craft and the yeah. art and the creativity of clothes. If you go to any of the exhibitions here too, I mean, you see exactly the same thing. I mean, my mood is uplifted by the craft yeah. of a beautiful dress or a color or a pair of shoes. <laughs> no, that's right. And you only really see them, you know, when you get close up that, you know, I, I mean, if you go into, you know, Chanel or Dior and you look at something really closely, you know, wow, you see how amazing it is, um, and fakes start looking quite fakey. But, but equally, I would argue that even if you don't care about clothes and are wearing, you know, stained, stained T-shirt and sweatpants, you're still wearing clothes. You know, you're still dressed. And that is, that is to me, of, of equal interest. How does that make you feel? Because so often, I think, we wear clothes as a form of armor because we're actually saying by what we wear, don't look at me. You know, d don't look at me. I, I, I used to like the early episodes of what not to wear because so very often what women were saying was, I don't want anybody to look at me. You know, I want to be invisible, but you never are invisible. So those are kind of quite important messages. That, um, that we're all sending out. And some people are just naturally have a fantastic eye and can dress themselves really beautifully. And some people, you know, are always going to struggle because of problems with size, of fit, of all, all, all that kind of thing. So, you know, we're all in this together is, I think, what I'm, try what I'm trying to say. Um, there, has, there has been criticism, though, of this um, particular approach where, you know, we are talking about shopping and um, fashion and brands and so on, too, and, of course, not everybody can afford... We know that. But how do you respond to the criticism also of you um, of having too great an interest in, in shopping and, and well, fashion? Um, compared with what? I mean, nobody ever criticises people for having too great an interest in nature, do they? <laughs> <laughs> you do realise this is a rhetorical Animals. question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it, it's just silly. You're interested in what you're interested in. It's, you know, it's that, that's ridiculous. Um, and, I, mentioned, you know, I, mentioned... I don't spend all my, you know, I don't spend, I only spend a fraction of my time being interested in this kind of thing. I'm interested in lots of other things as well. Um, uh, you know, many other things. Um, it, it's just that perhaps there aren't that many people around writers who, I, I remember when I was first asked to write a piece for Vogue and they said, the problem that we've got with features is that there are people who are incredibly interested in fashion, but they can't write. And then there are people who can write, but they're just not interested in fashion. So, you know, I, I was being constantly asked to write simply because I, you know, I sort of straddled both of those things and they just weren't that... Do you think that's still the case? Do you think there are too few people who write about fashion, interestingly? Um, well... As opposed to fiction in this case. I mean, 
there was a period of about three or four years when um, I went twice a year to London Fashion Week and wrote a little column about it with this thing called The Daily, which is the London Fashion Week newspaper. And in the end, I did get really quite tired of it. Um, and part of the reason why I got tired of it was because, you know, in the end, designers were being put through, you know, this terrible, terrible mill to be completely original twice a year. And, um, and in the end, you know, the clothes did all sort of started to blur into each other. And I did kind of come back to thinking, you know, what would that look like on me? Or thinking, oh, for God's sake. You, know? <laughs> um, uh, you still loved clothes I, after that. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. But, um, you know, it, 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 the rarefied world did start to feel incredibly repetitive. But on the other hand, I felt, you know, I had a great deal of feeling for, you know, you go to, I don't know if many people here have been to a show, but people seem to think it's like going to the theatre and you settle down, you know, for an hour and a half. The shows last for 12 minutes, max. You know, they're just up, down the runway, and then applaud, and then they're or, or not applaud and then they're off to the next one. They're when I, when I went up. to my first fashion yeah. show, I actually asked my money back because I couldn't believe, <laughs> couldn't believe it was so short. It was, I was so naive, but... Um. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, they're, they're over in, in literally minutes, and the designer's been working on this stuff for sort of months and months and months on end, and then there's kind of like this, and, you know, they're finished, they're mm. ruined, you know, mm. they, their clothes are not going to sell, the buyers aren't going to buy them. So I sort of felt much more kind of tragic about the designers. And I remember someone saying, you know, oh, that must be really awful to go to those shows and be surrounded by all those beautiful models. And the people I felt most sorry for were the models, because they didn't seem beautiful to me at all. Mm. They just seemed like kind of way-faced bean poles who, you know, were never allowed to eat anything mm -hmm. and who nobody ever really looked at. In The Thoughtful Dresser, which is yeah. a wonderful um, book of uh, your, your kind of manifesto, I suppose it is, um, if we're talking about new, new politics of today, um, your manifesto for, um, for fashion, I suppose, your own personal one, but also your interests and how certain people have inspired you. Um, it is an absolutely wonderful book. There's, and you're very, very honest. You're disarmingly honest about yourself and about people. And there was some criticism, as you know, again, I mean, I, I think it's a fantastic book. Everybody I know loves it. But there was some criticism about this juxtaposition of clothing. I mentioned the red shoe before um, with yeah. the Holocaust. Yeah. Um, is, is there anything out of bounds when well, you're describing clothes and fashion? I mean, there is a really remarkable description which completely took me aback when somebody told me about it. It's, it's contained in the diaries of one of the um, British officers who liberated Bergen-Belsen and it's in the um, Imperial War Museum and he describes how they entered the camp and it was completely horrifying and they were calling for all kinds of, you know, all kinds of things, you know, food, absolutely everything. And um, somehow there was some extraordinary mix-up, but um, a lorry load of lipstick arrived. And he was cursing, what on earth am I going to do with a lorry load of lipstick? But the women fell on the lipstick and they grabbed them and it was the use of the lipstick, he said, which made them feel human again. So, you know, you can't really argue with that. You can't argue with the fact that people who have been through terrible, horrifying experiences, which are supposed to make them feel that they're just far above the world of triviality, don't feel like that at all a lot mm -hmm. of the time. They often don't feel like that. Um, and so you're arguing with human nature, I think. The most of your um, protagonists in your novels are outsiders, um, yeah. not always lovable, they're marginal quite often, they have had difficult backgrounds, whatever, but they do find a form of ex self-expression through clothes. Um, why have you taken on their cause, their mantle, it's hardly a cause, but wh why are you so interested in them and how they express themselves? Um, I mean, 
I'm I'm thinking most recently of Adele in Upstairs at the Party, who's a a wonderful character. I think Adele in Upstairs at the Party is the closest to anybody like me that I've written in as much as she goes to university, she blacks her way into university and she thinks that she feels like she's a fake and she's come from a very particular Linda, background. Linda, can I just make sure you oh, sorry. Yes, And she's please. come from a very particular background so that when she comes up against that sli- slightly sort of politically correct student politics of the early 1970s, you know, she's quite sceptical. But when I started writing it, you know, I just went back to the clothes that we wore at the time. And people said to me, did you do, oh, you must have done a lot of research. I mean, it was all memory. And I, you know, I remembered very much how important clothes were to all of us, because that was how we defined ourselves as what are now known as tribes on the campus. (laughs) So, you know, what you wore defined, you know, who you were within the sort of various, you know, spheres of of the university at that period in the early 1970s. And we all borrowed each other's clothes a lot. We didn't have very many clothes. And the thing that was really, really critical about it was, first of all, we didn't listen to ABBA. We were not listening to ABBA. We were listening to people like the New York Dolls, who were much too cool for ABBA. And we were not wearing the sort of clothes that you see in photographs of the 1970s because we were too cool for them. So what we were wearing was what is now called vintage. Um, But then they were called second-hand. And you could go to a second-hand clothes shop in, you know, the early 1970s and find, you know, clothes from a house clearance from the 1920s and 30s. So you could find, you know, really quite remarkable clothes, you know. So we were all going to lectures wearing sort of, you know, crepe de chine tea gowns um, and evening dresses um, with feather boas. <laughs> I don't think any of us were lucky enough to find a Fortuny dress, but, you know, we'd have loved it if we had. So, you know, all those, all the, in all those ways, clothes were terribly, terribly important to us as students. And it would be ridiculous to say that it wasn't terribly important to us because, you know, it was part of our politics, it was part of you know, the way we related to the, you know, the drama society, all all of that stuff. And people who were dressing from CNA were this kind of, you know, know, we we regarded them as sort of the extras, you know, (laughs) in our, you know, our narcissistic little drama um, being played out on this very cold Yorkshire campus. Um, So it would have been completely ridiculous not to have written about clothes because, it was probably the period in my life when clothes were the most important. Probably slightly more important was aged around 15, 16, which is the time when you're, you know, you're really kind of, you know, getting away from your parental influence and you've got some money to buy your own clothes. Um, and you're, you know, you're buying those sort of little mod mini dresses. But I think at university, it, it was you know, really seeing for the first time, especially if you were from the provinces, um, people from London who had you know, a style that you'd never mm. seen before. That's interesting. When I come from Cornwall, and um, when I went to university, I wore only Laura Ashley dresses, because I thought yes. that's what you had to wear to university. No, we did. We- <laughs> there was, I think I was wearing Laura Ashley before I went to university, or these sort of long Laura Ashley dresses. And then I sort of quite quickly realised you've got to get rid of those. Yes, I get rid of that. I used to crinkle my hair as well, so I looked all sort of <laughs> bohemian. Um, the the other thing that's interesting about about your writing is, I mean, you, you studied English yourself, as as did Adele, um, is that you, you're so well read and you have so many wonderful um, quotes um, always when you're referring to other writers and so on. You seem to rem- well at least write about them, if not remember them. Um, there, there is a quote in um, Upstairs at the Party, which I think is absolutely wonderful, from, from the Duchess of Malfi, which you, which you use through the book um, at the beginning and the end. Um, Let all sweet ladies break their flattering glasses and dress themselves in her. Um, why did that quote strike you as so important? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't really exactly know what it means. But I sort of <laughs> but it's do. Such I mean, an ama- no, exactly. I, it, it is. I mean, the idea that you dress yourself in another person, which is exactly what is going on in this novel. 
um, people are dressing themselves in other, you know, in, I mean, there's a central character, Notterdale, who... Evie and... Evie, yes. who arrives, apparently, though this turns out not to be quite right, who seems to arrive as a sort of an alien entity in clothes that nobody has ever seen before and has a personal style which everybody else is trying to imitate, but he's inside deeply troubled. Um, and um, the, 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 I, I think what I, what I, what the, the thing about that quote is that there's a production actually of A Winter's Tale um, in, in, the, you know, in the novel, and so I wanted some sort of contemporary reference, and I found it, and I thought somehow that's it, that is her. People are dressing themselves in her. You're quoting um, all kinds of writers and um, other people who inspired you through the, um, the Thoughtful Dresser. Who, of, who do you read most um, willingly? Who do, you read, who do you like to read most? Well, um, I mean, I think, this is my personal view, I think that one of, I mean, certainly in my top two or three pantheons of 20th century writers, I would say Jean Rhys, though she is incredibly uncomfortable to read. Um, I think she is one of the greatest stylists because I can't see how she's done it. You know, I, you read and read and read, and there are these deceptively plain sentences, no figurative language, and suddenly you're hit, you know, like a kind of, you know, an, a knife beneath the rib, between the ribs. But she is painful, and she was a very difficult, I think quite unpleasant woman. But, you know, she's a woman without education who is living in this sort of demi one demi her characters and indeed herself are living in this sort of demi monde world in Paris, living off men, living really for you know if I could get a check, if only my previous lover would send me a check, then I could go out to shop and buy a dress, and then I could go and sit in a cafe and I could meet a man who would send me a check, and it's absolutely desperate. It's what would happen to. Jane Austen characters if they didn't have private incomes um, and this sort of descent into a kind of semi-prostitution. I find her work completely remarkable, particularly the lesser known, known works that were published in the 30s. I reread every few years Mrs. Dalloway, which I think is just the most wonderful novel about being alive and going shopping. <laughs> As you call it, um, the famous Gerard. And, and then I read writers who have nothing whatsoever to do with anything like that, like Philip Roth, who I think is, you know, probably the greatest living writer. And I read him over and over and over again. I've read all of his novels. Um, so um, I'm, you know, I'm reading all of the time but I think this sort of slightly does come a time in your life when you, know, when you wonder kind of how long exactly am I going to live and you think, you know, I don't want to die before I reread this again. So I think I'm at the moment doing a lot of rereading. You've written six novels, six novels. Um, can you, and they've all had in some way um, clothes as a you know, yeah. feature, which I think is, is remarkable and, and wonderful. It really is your voice. I would know one of your novels, you know, in a, in a darkened room or whatever the, the analogy is. But um, do you think you would ever write without writing about clothes? Yes. I mean, the novel that I'm writing at the moment doesn't have, has very little in the way of clothes, um, partly because everybody's in hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Do you think in fashion the introduction of off the peg, mass produced, makes a difference for novelists? When Dickens writing, when George Eliot's writing, the people, whatever their means, have actually selected what they want the garment to look like. Do you think this will affect how people wrote about characters after that? They're having to buy what's there in, in the chain shops? Well, I, I mean, the introduction of mass-produced clothing made an absolutely extraordinary difference to the way that people related to clothes. Because if you read 19th and early 20th century literature, one of the things you discover is how incredibly expensive clothes are. So that 
people would, you know, a, a jacket, for example, would, you know, could be several weeks wages and the jacket would have to last for many, many, many years. The poorer you were, you probably only had two items of clothing, work clothing and Sunday best. So the people's relationship, I think, to clothes and indeed to fashion was much, much more about the durability of the garment and how long it had to last them. And there is something that you see time and time and time again, really probably until the 60s, in which people are being judged by the, their class position and their wealth. There's a judgment being made on the visible cut and quality of their clothes, right? Um, so people are always being assessed, he wore a cheap suit, or you know, he, was, you know, he wore a good suit, or whatever it was. Um, and, and it's absolutely endemic until you get to the point where we're all, most people are wearing good quality mass produced clothes. And when I say good quality, I mean, you know, we think of, you know, the stuff that we're wearing in a Primark as being, you know, poor stuff. But actually it would be pretty good quality. Um, in really until probably the 19th century, early 20th century, what most women would do is they would go to a dressmaker and the dressmaker would show them some pictures or they would say, well, I would like something like that. So you see, you know, in Jane Austen, George Eliot, people are often going shopping for fabric rather than going shopping for a garment. And they go to the dressmaker and they say, I want the latest something or other. So that's a big one in, um, in Vanity Fair, you know, wanting, you know, wanting this latest style. And that could go on for quite a long time. Um, and you would see um, that a marker of poverty is having clothes that were very out of date. I mean, I don't think you could walk around London and say, I know that person's poor because their clothes are out of date. Because fashion is, you know, it, it's much more democratic example. So if you're, you know, walking around in jeans and a t-shirt, I mean, I think there was probably a period, you know, in around the 90s where a few people, a few men were still wearing flares, or maybe a late 80s. But most of the time, if you look at how people are dressed, you wouldn't, you might say that somebody is wearing something which is very this season, but you wouldn't say, I know they're poor because their clothes are out of date. Um, what I wondered was, do you think that it's the duty of the writer to, um, if you like, explore the psyche of clothing as brands become increasingly conceptual so that you can explain the psychology behind dressing as opposed to just the craftsmanship? I mean, by way of negating those um, fickle accusations from yeah. agents and those sorts of people. Yeah. I mean, what, what you're asking is something which is terribly difficult. I mean, it's something that, you know, I really, really struggle with. And I think that good fashion writers do have a way of looking at clothes, which is the same, which is the same way that they would look at art, you know, at, at any form of visual art. And you probably need to be quite well trained to be able to do that. I don't think it's easy. I don't think I know how to do it. I think clothes can be pretty metaphysical. And that's what Virginia Woolf is definitely trying to get at when she says she doesn't understand it. Um, so I think that we could very easily look at clothes in the same way that, for example, you know, on the Antiques Roadshow, for example, they'll bring you know, in a desk, they'll bring in a, a you know, piece of porcelain, some jewelry, and you know the dealer will analyze it and explain what it is and um, i don't think there's that much of that going on in the way that you know we talk about we talk about clothes thank you any any more questions one more there thank you what do you think of the current um 
trend or desire for people to make their own clothes, not as a necessity, but as a, as a rather um, indulgent, privileged hobby. <laughs> I do it myself, well, but you know, I, I it, mean, it, it, it costs it, a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, I mean, funnily enough, I think that it was, it's only relatively recently that making your own clothes has gone out of fashion. And the reason why is that it's more expensive to make your clothes than buy them. That didn't used to be the case. I mean, you used to go into any department store in the 50s and 60s, and there would be racks and racks and racks of Vogue and Simplicity patterns. Lots of people I knew made their own clothes. Um, and even, you did know, you ever make your own clothes? I did, very, very, very badly. Um, <laughs> I have no, no hand skills at all. Um, and it's, it's int I, I, remember, I remember when I was a teenager reading an article in something like Honey, you know, a magazine like that, about these girls who would buy clothes off the peg, but then they would alter them, you know. And I looked at what they did, and I go, God, that's really amazing, you know. <laughs> um, sort of didn't quite realize that these were probably girls who were going to fashion school, you know. Um, but I, I think that there's been a real suppression of that because of the incredible cheapness of, um, of off-the-peg clothes. And I, I rather like the idea, because when I say when I was at university, there were quite a few people who designed and made their own dresses. And I was just absolutely knocked out by this and you know, very much wanted to, you know, wanted to do it myself, but didn't have the wherewithal to do so. So I think it's rather good that it's coming back into fashion. And I, I don't think it's self-indulgent. I think it's pretty creative. There, are, there are, of course, countries where, I mean, in, um, in Norway and Scandinavia, they, they knit because they, I mean, every person I know in Norway knits, for instance, because they I, enjoy doing it. I think one you of know, the things which I find thing. completely infuriating is when people say, oh, you can go to a little dressmaker around the corner. Well, there may be little dressmakers around the corner somewhere in the country, but not in London, they're not. Because it's, it's not cheap. Well, in, but whereas in India or Pakistan yeah. or whatever, you would do that as yeah. much, of course, and Africa, of course. Um. I was really interested in what you said about people wearing clothes to make themselves invisible. Yeah. And um, I went to a WI conference one year, <laughs> and I, I mean, it's quite shocking to see so many people trying to look invisible yeah. with the, it's the skirt that kind of lands at a really unflattering place. So my question is, um, am I wrong to feel like that <laughs> and be so critical? And my second, second part is, should anything be out of bounds? Um, well, on, I, I mean, I, I do... My belief is... Um, and other people will disagree with me, is I think that the overwhelming majority of women, I, I don't think it's what the overwhelming majority of women care about that, what they look like. And that if you, if you give a woman who says she doesn't care what she looks like a dress which makes her look fabulous, she's not going to go, eh, you know, I don't, I don't think that happens. Um, I think they go, oh... <laughs> I think that as you get older, there is a fear of being mutton dressed as lamb. I think, and I think that's a kind of real and genuine fear. I think that's that's kind of quite realistic, to be honest. Um, and I think that there's a feeling which it, or which is. I'm menopausal, nobody is going to want to look at me anyway, so it doesn't matter what I wear. And the, there's a writer, a psychologist called Dorothy Rowe, who told me the most extraordinary story about being, going to check in at a hotel and standing there wearing beige, right? And this man in a suit came in after her, and she said, he clearly didn't see me. You know, she said I was, must have been like the flowers, you know, because he just strode past me. She said I was not visible to him. My, uh, my, his eye clearly couldn't get any purchase on me because <laughs> she was a menopausal woman wearing beige. 
And so what I would argue is I would prefer it myself if women were not invisible, particularly women over the age of 40 or 50. I would prefer it if women were out there in the world making a statement and saying, here I am, you know, I, I deserve the world's attention. Um, so that would be the answer to your question. Um, I, I also think that, you know, there are lots of people who don't really know how, you know, who are just a bit frightened of clothes and don't really know, you know, some people have got a fantastic eye and know how to do it and others just don't, you know. Um, is anything out of bounds? Um, well, you only have to look at Gareth Pugh. <laughs> he thinks nothing is out of bounds, but does anybody actually wear his clothes? <laughs> because we have to function, really, don't we? Um, but, you know, I, I do want to say, you know, finally, when people say clothes don't matter, I say, you know, would you wear the same clothes for going for a run and going to a job interview or going to a wedding? And they all go, well, yeah, obviously, you know. So most people seem to understand, I think, that clothes perform extraordinary series of, of, of functions and you're always being... People are looking at you, whether you want to be looked at or not. And people are forming impressions about you silently, and you can't help that. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, so saying that what you wear doesn't matter, it does matter to somebody else. It's just you're not aware of it. Clothes do matter. Yes. Clothes do matter. I mean, if you just consider the attention that Jeremy Corbyn has elicited because of his clothes, I mean, um, it's... <laughs> Obviously, Linda and I need to go off and advise Jeremy Corbyn and everybody else in the government, I think, on what they should wear. They really are the worst dressers, our politicians. Yes, have you seen this, this photograph of his legs? He has these very thin ankles and his trousers have ridden up. And he's wearing these sort of very long black socks with those kind of pool shoes, you know, kind of slides. Very <laughs> odd. <laughs> but people have noticed it. Yes, know, they have noticed it. And yeah. that, is, that is probably the moral of our story tonight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But um, clothes do matter, and that's but, wonderful. Know, but the, the thing is that you know all the car, you know one of the Times cartoonists are showing him wearing that cap that he used to wear with a red star on it. You know, it's a Lenin cap. So immediately, that is him. That's become He's the done. iconic image already. It's, hasn't it's it? an iconic image of him as Lenin mm. yeah. in that cap. So you know he's been wearing that for years and years and years, never thinking he was going to be the leader of the Labour Party, mm. and anybody was ever going to pay attention to what he was wearing. But, uh, but. there's a lesson for you. Ah, <laughs> oh, indeed. Now, um, unfortunately, we must end it there. But do join me. Uh, on December the 2nd for Yong Chang, who will be talking about the Empress Dowager Xi Xi and um, imperial clothing in China as well. She and has the writing. most incredible Izzy Miyake dress. I've seen it, yes. <laughs> she may even wear it. You never know. She may wear something Chinese. Thank you so much to all of you. It's always a joy working with you. Um, and finally, the one and only Linda Grant. Thank you so much. <laughs>